2020, eh? A year that most of us are glad to see the back of. There are so many reasons to never look back and instead look ahead to the new year. But there were some exciting developments in diabetes research throughout 2020, including improvements in the transplant of insulin producing cells, new techniques to bring back hypo awareness, the development of smart insulin, and is type one diagnosis in later life really type one? All of that and much, much more in the first ever diabetes research review. Hello everyone, my name is Jamie Lowe and here on my channel I do my best to keep you up to date with all the latest developments. So if you are interested in that, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and follow me on all of my social media. Now today we are looking at developments in research from Diabetes UK funded scientists throughout the year. We've got so much to get through today and we'll get right into it in just a moment, but make sure you stay tuned because I'm dropping a few personal announcements in the mix too. But here we go, on with the research review. First, an islet transplant is where doctors transplant pancreas cells from a donor into people with type 1 diabetes. Now, it's by no means a new form of treatment, um, but this form of treatment can help people to temporarily produce their own insulin again, but currently it isn't considered a cure. However, Diabetes UK funded researchers at the University of Edinburgh pioneered a new method involving transplanting pancreas cells together with structural cells from umbilical cords. They found that when mice with diabetes received this new type of islet transplant, they had better glucose uh, levels and were less likely to reject the transplant compared to islet transplants without the umbilical cord cells. Now this is considered a promising step forward, which could lead to islet transplants becoming more effective and more widely available in the future. Next up, hypo awareness can be the difference between a fun sized bag of Haribos and a trip to the hospital. And over time, some people with diabetes can stop noticing when their blood sugars go too low but we don't fully understand why just yet. Diabetes UK funded researcher Dr. Catriona Farrell found that it could be down to the body getting used to low blood sugar levels and it doesn't respond then in the same way after repeated hypos. She discovered that by introducing a shock to the system, by giving people with type 1 diabetes a session of high intensity exercise, she could override this response and reset how people's brains adapt to hypos. Diabetes UK say they are continuing to fund Dr. Farrell to do a longer term clinical trial, but this study hints that exercise could offer a new and simple way to help people with type 1 diabetes get their hypo awareness back. And actually, as I'm talking about this, I think of the times when I have hypos after I've exercised in the day. So I've exercised really hard in the day, maybe done a fitness class and also gone for a run, which is what I do sometimes in lockdown. And a nighttime hypo after that feels like the worst hypo in the world. So I can actually see from my own experience that she could be onto something here. Next, some groundbreaking research, which surprised me at first, showed for the first time that children who are diagnosed with type one diabetes under the age of seven appear to have a different form of the condition to those diagnosed at the age of 13 or above. Now, I was diagnosed at the age of 23, which is a decade away from 13. So that would suggest that I have this newly discovered form of diabetes. The team at University of Exeter studied pancreas samples and they discovered that in younger children, more immune cells had invaded the pancreas and not many insulin making beta cells had survived. But in samples from people diagnosed over the age of 13, there were fewer attacking immune cells and they had more beta cells that were still producing insulin. According to Professor Noel Morgan, who worked on the project, this could help us to understand what causes type 1 diabetes and in unlocking avenues to prevent future generations of children from getting the condition. Now, I am no means a scientist, but I was going through just about the most stressful period ever in my life when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and I've often wondered if that's got anything to do with it. But you know, it's only through research funded by charities like Diabetes UK that we'll ever get a chance to find out. 
Now, a little personal news about me. I am sort of jobless right now. If you've been on my channel for a while or a follower, maybe, you'll know that ever since I left university, I was a presenter and a reporter for a company who will remain nameless and who I worked my backside off. Um, and they sort of did me dirty after working me to the bone through the pandemic. I get into all the gory details in one of my recent podcast episodes. There'll be a link to that somewhere in the screen or in the bio or the description. So check that out if you want to. But ultimately what is happening is I'm giving this a go. This, YouTube, podcast, social media. I wanna make more frequent and better quality content, which will always remain free to people who want it, who enjoy it, who just need to see it. But if you did want to support me, then there are ways to go about that. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Jamie Low TV, there, from as little as one pound a month, you can get access to exclusive content and be in direct daily communication with me. Or if you fancy supporting in a different way, then you can go to shop.spreadshirt.co.uk forward slash broken dash pancreas dash gang. And there you can get your hands on t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and loads of other stuff with designs on that I made myself. Uh, this funny little freestyle Libra design is my favorite right now. So uh, if you fancy wearing or I don't know, owning a cushion with that on, then I'd be eternally grateful. I think there's a discount on the whole shop right now. I'll be keeping that running for as long as I'm absolutely allowed to. So do check that out if, if you fancy supporting. But by like I said, there's, there's no need to. Um, it's only for people that want to. All right, back to the research then. And a story I think I covered in my first T1D news update, which was the world's first artificial pancreas app, which was launched in 2020, developed by Professor Roman Havorka and his team at the University of Cambridge. The world's first licensed artificial pancreas app is backed by 13 years of research funded by Diabetes UK, JDRF, and others. To start out with, the app is being supported by a small number of diabetes clinics in the UK and is available to buy on subscription but the researchers behind it hope that one day it will be available to anyone who has type 1 diabetes who could benefit from it next up in June, 12,500 scientists and healthcare professionals came together virtually, as you would do in 2020, to share uh, the very latest on diabetes care and research at the 80th American Diabetes Association scientific sessions. One of the highlights from the conference came from TrialNet scientists, who I believe are sort of in the Southwest, and they're working to find out ways to prevent type 1 diabetes. They gave us an update on their breakthrough clinical trial, which showed for the first time that type 1 diabetes can be delayed. Their latest results show that 78% of people who received a dummy drug had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes during the trial, and it took an average of two years for them to develop type 1. This compares to only 50% of participants who were treated with an immunotherapy drug called, wait for it, tepilizumab. Tepilizumab, I think that's right. They took an average of five years to advance to a type 1 diabetes diagnosis. That's an extra three years without type 1 diabetes, free from testing your blood sugar, carb counting, injections, hypos, and all of the emotions that come with living with the conditions. And that means that if I was given that drug, I probably would only be developing type 1 right now. Isn't that madness? Now next up, we used to believe that type 1 diabetes couldn't happen in the very first few months of life. Instead, if a baby was diagnosed with diabetes under six months old, we thought it must be neonatal diabetes, which is caused by a simple genetic mistake. But UK research fellow Dr. Richard Oram discovered a rare group of children who were diagnosed with diabetes under six months old, but didn't have any of the genetic mistakes known to cause neonatal diabetes. In a new study, he found evidence which confirms that type 1 diabetes can develop in children under the age of six months. This is important because type 1 and neonatal diabetes are treated differently. So it's really, really important that children get the right diagnosis. What's more is that Dr. Oram found evidence hinting that the immune attack behind type 1 diabetes could even begin in the womb. The next step will be to figure out how it's possible for type 1 diabetes to develop so early on and whether these insights could open up new ways to prevent or treat the condition in the future. 
And finally today, researchers in Copenhagen have developed a new smart insulin that can sense blood sugar levels. The new type of insulin has a built-in molecular switch, as it's called. As blood sugar levels rise, the molecule becomes more active and therefore it releases more insulin. As blood sugar levels drop, less insulin is released. The research team tested the insulin molecule in rats and showed that changes in the blood sugar levels were able to effectively drive the release of insulin or stop it. The next step is to refine the molecule so that it works more rapidly and accurately. In future, smart insulin could mean that people would only have to take insulin once a day and then the insulin would handle the rest at the molecular level to keep blood sugars in range. Now this is obviously very exciting, but as with a lot of these things, research is still at a very early stage. Years of further research and clinical trials are going to be needed to find out if this insulin could be used safely and effectively by people with diabetes. So all in all, during what was a very rough year, research funded by charities like Diabetes UK continued to make many breakthroughs and that occurred, all of that occurred as a result of their funding. All of that in a year when income for charities has dropped dramatically. So more than ever, they need our support. Head to diabetes.org.uk to find out how you can help and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and follow me on social media for more videos and updates just like this. But thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.